enormous responsibility is on the shoulders of anyone who is lucky enough to be successful. Perfection does not exist. There's a story behind every story. I saw hope and possibility in life and love and meaning inside of the difficulties. This is my story and this is my life and I can't hide it. The shock of the impact of what you actually seen and smelled and touched, it stays with you. Every single person can make a difference in the world and every little thing counts. I'm a guy who uh, want to write his own story. As the founder of the Virgin Group of Companies, Sir Richard Branson isn't just a business magnet and master brand builder. He's also one of the coolest billionaires on the planet. His approach to business is often unconventional, creating sensational guerrilla marketing events. He fearlessly jumps in head first. And his approach to life isn't much different. Now his daughter, Dr. Holly Branson, a young woman filled with passion and intelligence, has joined him in the family business. Together, they are a force to be reckoned with, committed to leaving the world better than how they found it. True examples of shameless idealists. I have a mother that was a great believer in pushing her children and you know, trying to make sure that we stood on our own two feet, as she put it. And there was one time that we were driving to my grandmother's house and she pushed me out of the car about three miles before we got there and told me to make my own way there. Now, I think you ought to know that I was about five years old at the time. And I think today she would have got arrested. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so I headed off across the fields, got completely lost and ended up at a farmer's house. And I think by then my mother began to realize that she did, maybe this was one step too far. Fortunately, my mum would never let my dad uh, drop me off and put me in the middle of the street at five years old. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of the way she brought us up turned out OK. I did make a stand on our own two feet. We were a very close family, and we had lots of love and, and, and uh, you know, lots of praise as, we, as we, we were being brought up. You know, that gave us lots of stability in our lives. So, so I think that, you know, that we, we were very, very fortunate. I'm dyslexic, um, which means that I wasn't, you know, very good at conventional education. I'd look at the blackboard and everybody else could understand what was going on in the blackboard. And to me, it was a jumble. And so I would sit at the back of the class and be planning a, a magazine. I, the, the Vietnamese War was taking place and I was trying to start a magazine to campaign against the war. Age 15, the headmaster said, look, you, you're either going to have to run your magazine uh, and leave school or not run the magazine and stay at school. Leaving school at 15 without any money is not necessarily a good idea, but I had a vision. I, I wanted to start a national magazine for young people, run by young people, so I managed to sell enough advertising that enabled us to get the magazine going, and we managed to sell you know, some, some 50,000 copies of the first issues. And although we didn't make a lot of money out of it, 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 it was my education, it got me up and going. And then one thing led on to another. I heard a tape from a young artist and loved, loved, the, loved their music. Plus, tubular bells. Went around to record companies, tried to get them to you know, release the record, nobody would. And, and so I decided to form a little record company and put, put the music out, and it became very successful. The label released popular albums that defined an era of rock and roll. Meanwhile, Branson was already thinking about his next conquest. If I see that something's not being done very well, I'll give it a go. You know, so I used to fly a lot on other people's airlines and found the experience was dreadful and um, thought, you know, maybe I'll try to buy a second hand plane and um, managed to persuade Boeing to let me have a second hand 747. If you build a company from scratch and you don't have financial backing, there's only really one word that matters and that's survival. And for many years, we were just fighting to survive. I suspect the most frightening moment was, you know, when, when I launched uh, Virgin Atlantic, the airline, we had just the one plane and we came back from the inaugural flight and I found my bank manager sitting on my doorstep and 
the bank had decided to foreclose on the whole Virgin Group because we'd gone a tiny bit over our overdraft facility. I've never felt so angry in my life, so I sort of picked him up and just pushed him out of the house, which is not a very wise thing to do to your bank manager, and told him he, he was never, never welcome in our house ever again. And then I went, went back inside and uh, I was just shaking, you know, shaking in, you know, sort of anger. Well, fortunately, over the weekend, we managed to scrape and borrow some money from around the world and we managed to build the company very successfully. But we came that, that close to, to being bankrupt. And over the years, we've sort of set up something like 350 different companies, but, you know, trying to go in and shake up big conglomerates in different, in different sectors and, you know, give them a prod in their fat bellies and uh, do it slightly differently than it's been done before. One thing that, I, that I've always done is work from home. You can work from home, you can see your kids grow up. Um, so, you know, literally, Holly would be crawling around or occasionally might be changing the nappies or, you know, or, or whatever, having, having meetings, having, uh, you know, just, just building, you know, building our companies. And, and the great thing, having our kids around us was we were a very close family. We had a very, very normal upbringing, apart from the likes of Mick Jagger wandering through the house or, <laughs> um, you know, famous people coming through our house. But to us as kids, you don't, you don't notice that. You just think it's a, you know, a normal life. We like to spend time together with family. Family is really important to both, both of us. Where are you going? Huh? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Up there. <laughs> Dad's idea. We like to find the adventures in life. Maybe I'm slightly more reckless than her. Yeah, like that, that, def that. definitely more reckless. <laughs> <laughs> While Virgin Records was making rock and roll history, Sir Richard Branson set his sights skyward. But how would he compete with the large, established companies that had long dominated the airline industry? When I decided to launch the airline, um, I met up with somebody called Sir Freddie Laker, who'd had an airline before that had been driven out of business by British Airways, called, called Laker Airways, and, um, and I asked him for some advice. He said, look, you're never going to be able to get the money to spend the advertising to beat British Airways. What you've got to do is use yourself, get out there and, you know, make sure that you get on the front pages of the newspapers. And believe it or not, I was quite shy in, in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but Sir Richard realized the only way he'd be able to generate publicity for his companies was to overcome his shyness and grab some serious attention. I was soon attempting to break the transatlantic record for the fastest boat across the Atlantic. Uh, of course, it sank. Uh, and, uh, and then I was trying to break the record for the first crossing of the Atlantic in a hot air balloon, and, you know, of course, it sank. <laughs> and, and then we were trying to, to cross the Pacific and be the first people to cross the Pacific in a hot air balloon, and we missed Los Angeles, where we were aiming for by three and a half thousand miles and ended up in the Arctic. And, you know, once again on a, on a, on a lake <laughs> uh, and got, re got once again rescued by helicopters. I, rem I do remember the Around the World balloon trip, so I was about 15 then, so that's when I was starting to realise that, that, you know, he may never come back. And I remember feeling pretty worried about those. And although, you know, we weren't always successful, even when the boat was, you know, sunk in the water, the Virgin sign was still sticking out of the water. And, um, you know, somehow I think the Virgin brand you know, became respected for adventure, you know, the, the adventure side, pushing the limits. They're jumping off the buildings. I think he's just a bit silly, but <laughs> I know he's going to be finding things like that. Now, hold on a minute. She's, she's doing some of these things with me now. So, so, so... Actually, I do, I do like the adventure. <laughs> I just, I think I weigh up the pros and cons a bit more than he does. He just says yes, and I actually think about it a little bit. We actually had quite a fun trip uh, trying to break the world record sailing across the Atlantic. That was pretty hairy. We got on the sailing boat and we knew we were heading into a hurricane. And the hurricane was going to push us all the way to uh, England from New York. And it Probably was. It caught us up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did catch us up and it was a pretty hairy trip. Oh, uh, well, we're doing our best. We just uh, have got into weather that is perhaps a little bit too strong for the boat. 
Uh, but unfortunately, after two days, we had to, had to abandon because our main sail had ripped. But it's quite fun doing those trips together. And my brother came on that one too, so it was a, it was a real bonding experience. Oh, it's great. To, look, you know, it's lovely to be able to do these adventures and have Holly and Sam do them with me. And then, of course, next year, we also hopefully will go to space together, so that can't be bad. Did you hear that? We hope to go to space together. That can't be bad. <laughs> <laughs> We're building a spaceship. <laughs> That's pretty unreal. It is. it is. Yeah, have to pinch ourselves. <laughs> You'd think that space would be the final frontier, but not for Sir Richard. He's got other far-reaching ideas. 80% of the species on Earth in the sea that have never been discovered, um, I might think, hmm, maybe we should try to build a little submarine to go and, you know, to the bottom of the oceans and find these species. So maybe we should find a technician to see whether we can overcome the pressure, this enormous pressure on this submarine at the bottom of the seas, 37,000 foot underwater, um, pressure of maybe 1,600 times more than the pressure on an aeroplane. And anyway, so you start asking all these questions and thinking, OK, let's give it a go. <laughs> and let's see if we can't, you know, um, find the technicians to build the submarine to make it possible to go and find these species and see what's going on down there. If you're determined enough, uh, you, can get, you, can, you can fulfill your dreams. The kind of wealth that goes with um, uh, being a successful business uh, person could be viewed as, a, a, as obscene. And therefore, I think an enormous responsibility is, is on the shoulders of anyone who is lucky enough to be successful and, and is lucky enough to, you know, to have created considerable wealth through, through say, running, running, um, running a business. But the responsibility um, is gigantic and the responsibility is that if you've got that kind of wealth is you've got to reinvest it in creating more jobs throughout the world particularly in countries where they desperately need jobs to be created you've got to invest that money in tackling some of the you know most fundamental issues in the world it's incredible to be in a position where, where you can make a difference to you know hopefully you know thousands and thousands of people's lives and um, by existing and by you know, by um, being ready to say yes. From the very beginning, Sir Richard Branson has been motivated by his social conscience. This clearly runs in the family because his daughter, Holly, is equally driven to make the world a healthier place. I was fortunate that my daughter didn't inherit uh, my dyslexia, so, uh, you know, she's the bright one in the family. Ever since the age of three, my mum always says that if she asked me what I wanted to do when I was older, I'd say I want to be a doctor. And I think as a young person growing up, it makes life so much easier when you have that drive to want to do something. And I absolutely loved it, six years at medical school and then working within the um, hospitals in London. And then I did an even different, more different thing and left to go and work with my dad. <laughs> Stepping away from medicine to business was quite a daunting experience because it's such different um, environments. I didn't want to, at, at, any, at any stage, try to persuade her to come in, into the company at the time that she was training to become a doctor. But Holly inherited her father's passion for change and joined the Virgin team in a non-profit arm of the company, Virgin Unite. I've seen the wonderful projects that are happening everywhere and you just want to make the most of it. And, get out there and try and help as many people as possible. I think she can you know, put her medical training to good use and her good brains to good use to try to make a real difference in the world. Virgin Unite tries to focus on harnessing all the energy of customers and employees. Coming into a company that is so diverse and employs about 60,000 people, it's amazing to think about if you harness all those people's energy for the future, you'd be able to do some really great things in the world. Not only would I like Virgin to keep growing as a company, but I'd love all those people to volunteer, raise money, increase awareness about charitable things around the world. And I'd love that to grow in the future. In 2011, Holly visited some of our Free the Children projects in Kenya. I got to go and 
bead necklaces and bracelets with the mamas and see the wonderful medical clinic that they've set up out there um, that helps many thousands of people. Instead of having to walk miles and miles to go and get healthcare, it's right on their doorstep now. Free the children will put water into schools, which means children can actually go to school instead of having to walk to the rivers and collect water. They're getting an education in schools that Free the Children have built. I just really feel that on the last night I wanted to bottle up the feeling I had, um, to truly use it over and over again, because it was a feeling that every single person can make a difference in the world, and even if you're just doing the smallest thing, every little thing counts. Holly and Sir Richard are taking leading roles in confronting some of the world's most challenging problems. We're trying to tackle global warming through the, the, the carbon war room, through the, the Earth Prize. We're trying to tackle disease in Africa through a Center for Disease Control that we're setting up. Species that are being threatened in the world, like sharks and lemurs and tigers, through other organizations that we support. Most of these issues are solvable, and I think, you know, with, with uh, enough determination and enough people wanting to solve these problems, they, they, they can be solved. And we just got to, all, all, all of us, combine together to try to help get on top of these problems. To be a good leader, you, you've got to be a good listener. In fact, I think all, everybody, you know, all, all the kids watching this program, it's so important to be good listeners. And uh, by being good listeners, I can see situations where, the, the, you know, where, I, where maybe I can get in and make a difference or, or, or where I can help. Just before the invasion of Iraq, um, you know, I, was, I thought it was wrong for Britain and America um, to invade Iraq. Um, there was no justification for it. And, um, and I spoke with Nelson Mandela and Kofi Annan, two, two great world statesmen, and, uh, and asked if they would consider going to see Saddam Hussein and persuade him to uh, go and live in Libya um, in order to save his, his country from, from this invasion. And sadly, the day they were, were going to go, the bombing started. And as a result of that, you know, Peter Gabriel and myself sat down and we thought, you know, let, let's form a group of elders 12 most respected men and women in the world who can go in and try to resolve conflicts in the world. And the Elders is headed up by Nelson Mandela and his wonderful wife, Grasha Michelle, and Archbishop Tutu is the chairman, and they do go into conflict regions and try to resolve them. If you're brought up um, with a conscience, then you'd, I think you'd feel guilty wasting the position you find yourself in. I mean, I'm incredibly fortunate to be able to make a difference to other people's lives. Sir Richard built an empire from little more than ambition and entrenched values. At a time when he could quit and disappear into a mountain of money, he's more visible and relevant than ever. It's much more fun in life to say yes than it is to say no. And it's much more fun in life to get off your ass and, and just go and, and do things. And as my mother used to say to me, don't just you know, sit in front of the television watching other people achieving things. And you know, go and make a difference yourself. That's exactly what his daughter is doing. She's committed much of her time to humanitarian causes. Through Virgin Atlantic's partnership with Free the Children, I have been very privileged over the years to travel with and get to know their wonderful team. I asked Holly to be a speaker at We Day an annual event that aims to inspire and engage young people to get involved in social activism. The organizers weren't joking when they told me there'd be 18,000 of you here enjoying We Day. You are such a great crowd. I've never spoken in front of more than a few hundred people, let alone thousands of people, so it was pretty amazing. I was extremely nervous for Holly, <laughs> but um, she seemed to be handling it um, ridiculously well. So. This is the amazing thing about Free the Children. They have a holistic view of breaking the cycle of poverty by teaching the mamas to make a living, introducing healthcare into a community, and getting clean water into the school, and also getting kids an education. All of this demonstrates that helping someone less fortunate is not about imposing our standards, our cultures, our beliefs, and our expectations on a group of people. 
It's about giving them the opportunities to lift themselves out of hardship. I think it's already in my genes to want to do good in the world. I'd like to think in my lifetime that poverty can be eradicated. It'd be what, such a wonderful thing to, to, to stamp out in the world and make sure people get that few dollars that they need to survive. I think I can return that. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet. <laughs> and Holly's father! Now I spend much more of my time on not-for-profit, so building, you know, ventures that are not-for-profit rather than for-profit, but, um, but the sort of first half of my life, built the engine that can help make the not-for-profits work. You know, what I've learned throughout my life in, in business is the business must be more than just you know, a money-making machine. Um, it's, it, it's not satisfying the people who work for a company if, you know, all, all that matters is, uh, you know, the results at the end of each quarter and, uh, and nothing else matters. So if you can turn every single business in the world into a force for good, into an organisation that really wants to go out and make a difference in people's lives, uh, you know, then, then I think the world can get on top of most of the problems that exist, exist today. We're trying to lead by example at Virgin and trying to encourage you know, lots of other companies to join us.